Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Garriott, and as president of the Explorers Club, I would like to welcome you to Climate Week at the Explorers Club. There should be no one in the world today that hasn't uh, heard about and isn't affected by the climate crisis we are facing. For the next few days, you will hear from the world's leading explorers, scientists, and experts in their fields who are using cutting edge technology to make an impact on the greatest crisis humanity has ever faced. To start off the week, please welcome Dr. Michael Weiner. Good evening. My name is Michael Weiner. I'm a climate scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and a recent author on the IPCC sixth assessment report of Working Group One. It's my pleasure tonight to welcome you to the Explorer Club's program on big ideas, innovative solutions to combat climate change. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the report and some of its key findings and some of my own uh, current research on extreme weather. This is a picture of Houston uh, right after Hurricane Harvey showing the devastating flooding that uh, occurred after that storm. Um, it's been well established that there was a human influence on Hurricane Harvey to increase the precipitation during that storm, adding to the flooding and the misery in that uh, area. But before I start, I must make it clear that I'm what I tell you tonight are my own opinions, not that of the United States Department of Energy, the University of California, nor the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. These are my opinions and my opinions alone. So let's talk about the two reports that you should be well aware of by now. The most recent is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And one of the highlighted statements from that report was it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. The language has become stronger with each subsequent report of the IPCC. This is the strongest statement to date. The fourth U.S. National Climate Assessment um, it, back in 2017, I was uh, part of that one as well, uh, wrote that it is likely that all of the observed climate change is due to human changes to the composition of the atmosphere. So far, we estimate that that change is about a little bit over one degree centigrade, about two degrees Fahrenheit, uh, since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. And our best estimate is that it is due to, it is entirely due to uh, the consumption of fossil fuels, of uh, coal, oil, and natural gas. What's some of the evidence for this? Well, I think one of the big things is that this the planet is warmer than it's ever been, um, at least uh, in the recorded record. And um, what we see on the, on the right here are uh, the observational record is that this uh, bouncy, um, squiggly uh, um, black line of the global surface uh, air temperature, global mean surface temperature. temperature. And the, um, the, the solid black line is the average of a, a whole grouping of global climate models. The range is shown um, in the uh, in the in the light tan shading, so there is you know a, a bound on that, an uncertainty bound, or a confidence interval, or I prefer to say. Um, and the blue lines are the same climate models, but run without the addition of the atmospheric carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that were resulting from the burning of fossil fuels. And we can see that by now, the signal has clearly arisen out of the noise in that um, we cannot simulate the observed pattern um, and magnitudes of temperatures on the planet without accounting for the additional greenhouse gas that has been added to the atmosphere. And in fact, this is very, very warm climate. Um, and uh, this picture here shows uh, back to the last 2,000 years that the temperature now is warmer than it's been for 2,000 years. And in fact, it's really the warmest period, uh, depending on how you look at it, for the last 100,000 years. So pretty much all of human evolution has never experienced temperatures this, uh, this warm. If you go back millions of years, you can find planets that were warm, as warm as now, or even warmer. But the important point is that those changes happened over the periods of many thousands of years, whereas this is happening in just a few decades. And so it, from a point of view of an adaptation, this is really unprecedented in the, the history of the planet. 
So the IPCC wrote this time in a very strong statement, it is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change, making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall, droughts, and droughts more frequent and severe. And of course, this is where my own particular research interests uh, lie, and I was on the chapter on extreme weather for, for the uh, this sixth assessment report. Here's another figure from the Summary for Policymakers, and I recommend that you read the Summary for Policymakers. It's a, it's a condensed uh, version of the entire 12-chapter um, uh, uh, plus an atlas report, um, which I don't think any single person could possibly read in, in any reasonable amount of time, um, talking about extreme temperatures over land. And, and let's concentrate on the 50-year the event. So this would be the once every, one, what you'd expect to happen once every 50 years, or a little, little more often than once in a lifetime. And, and it now occurs five times over that 50 years, instead of once over that 50 years, compared to where it would have been if there hadn't been the human interference in the climate system. The IPCC this time, for the, for the first time really, considered different uh, global warming levels. Um, 1.5 and 2 degrees were targets that were uh, specified by the Paris Agreement. And um, we considered these scenarios as well as warmer scenarios. And um, so that 50-year event would hap happen now nine times if the climate stabilized at 1.5 degrees and 14 times at a 2 degree level or 40 times, almost 40 times, at a 4 degree warmer world than the pre-industrial. Well, that's up 40 times in 50 years means that that's happening almost all the time. So what had been a 50 year event for our grandparents in a 4 degree warmer world is pretty much the norm. And for a map of this, uh, I'd like you to look at this top panel and ignore the bottom one for now. Um, it shows the change locally over for the hottest day of the year under these global warming scenarios. And so um, what you see is at 1.5 degrees, um, the, 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 the hottest day of the year is, you know, maybe three degrees centigrade warmer than it would have been without uh, climate change. By the time you get to four degrees, we're looking at seven or eight degrees over the United States and, and Europe, uh, less in some places, more in others. And so extreme weather, seem heat waves actually change it over land, change at a, gr a rate greater than the average global warming, which is an important point when considering the impacts. Similar statements were made for precipitation and drought. Confidence in temperature changes are considerably higher than they are for precipitation, but you can see that that even now there's some likely increase in the 10-year event. Um, and by the time you get to four degrees, you know, instead of having it every 10 years, you know, instead of the 50-year, we're looking at 10 years now, um, it would be once every three, you know, once every three years or four years. So a fairly common event. And similarly for drought, these of course are the kinds of events that have impacts on human and ecological systems. So let's talk a little bit about rain. I, I've spent a lot of time uh, working on this subject. And um, in the, if you look at the average of rainfall, uh, some places get wetter and some places get drier and some places don't change much at all for the average. But in general, there'll be fewer storms but will be more intense. And so when one looks at the wettest day of the year, the rainiest day of the year, we see increases. Um, like I said, confidence is higher in temperature than in precipitation. And so what you can see, you really have to get to a lot more warming before these things show up very, uh, very clearly here. Um, but, you know, you're looking at, you know, in the eastern United States, maybe a 25% change in the in the rainiest day of the year. So, so and that would kind of translate into the more rare storms as well which is actually a sizable amount when you consider the impacts of flooding and, and et cetera. So let's talk about now. Um, with apologies to William Shakespeare, 2021 is the summer of our discontent. It has been pretty much a disastrous year across the Northern Hemisphere for extreme weather. We, we sort of started, or at least awareness became, uh, started with the Pacific Northwest heat wave, which I, uh, a rapid attribution study by the World Weather Attribution uh, uh, Group uh, said that climate change made it two degrees centigrade warmer, about four degrees Fahrenheit, and at least 150 times more likely than it would have been without climate change. 
There are other heat waves that have happened elsewhere. This is probably the most unexpected one in terms of how much warmer it was than previous records. Um, but dangerous heat waves have happened across the United States, Europe, and China um, this summer with much suffering. People die in these things. In fact, more people die in heat waves than any other kind of weather event. There have also been some big floods um, right after the, the Pacific Northwest heat wave. Uh, there, was, there were devastating rapid uh, uh, flash floods in Germany that, that also killed a lot of people. And then not just uh, last month was Hurricane Ida which um, late in its evolution went over New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And again, many people died uh, by drowning in their, in their basement and garden apartments. So tragic events that have clear human influences on them. Western U.S. drought, as much has been, been made of that, uh, this, is another, this is an interesting and more difficult problem for us. Uh, it's hard to make a statement about the human influence on the rainfall, but it's certainly easy to make a, human, a statement about the human influence on soil moisture and available runoff for reservoirs. And so it impacts our water supplies, whether or not the rain is, 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 changes or not. Um, this is a particularly dry year, and so everything is exacerbated by these higher temperatures. And again, we come back to temperature and wildfires. And, and uh, in, here in California, fire has been a factor in, in three of the last four summers with extremely poor air quality throughout the state. This year, so bad that it's been, been uh, uh, carried by the winds farther east all the way to New York in, in, in affecting air quality for, for tens, if not hundreds of millions of people. There also were big fires in Colorado not just in the United States, British Columbia has had them for a couple of years. Greece, Turkey, and Spain have all had uh, terrible uh, and unprecedented uh, wildfires. I mentioned attribution on the Pacific Northwest heat wave. Uh, this is my area of research. I'm interested in, in today's events you know, and asking this question, how much has global warming already changed these particular individual events? We borrow techniques from epidemiology and ask really two questions. How is the probability of this event changed for the Pacific Northwest heat waves? It's 150 times more likely for that temperature to be reached. Or how much did climate change affect the magnitude of this event? So for a given frequency, um, an estimate of the rarity of that event, we estimated that it was two degrees warmer than it would have been otherwise. I wanted to show you a simulation from my colleague, Chris Patricola, about what we did for Hurricane Katrina. Uh, this is a model simulation, um, but the red dots are the actual observations of the center of the storm. And this gives you an idea that our computer models are actually really good at simulating uh, these extreme weather events. Hurricane Katrina, of course, devastated New Orleans and, the, uh, and, and Mississippi and other parts of the Gulf Coast. And you can see that, the, that it looks kind of like, it's made to look kind of like r real observations but it actually tracks the real observations quite well. And if you didn't know this was a model, you might not be able to tell the difference. But we use those kind of simulations to do kind of, two kinds of experiments. One is, what's the climate look like now? What's the, what's the storm look like under today's climate? What does the storm look like if we change the climate? So we say we go make an estimate of how much the climate is, has changed. And we, use the, we make a counterfactual experiment, a, a, a thought experiment, sort of a numerical thought experiment, and say, what would this storm look like there then? And we, we compared the, in this case, the rainfall from Hurricane Maria, which devastated Puerto Rico. And we see that the, in the, this, this simulation, this composite simulation of the actual storm, the rainiest part of the storm changed the most. And if we add warming to say, what would this happen in the, would the storm look like in the future? It's even greater, of course. And again, this part of the rainiest part of the storm um, uh, increases the most. Now, this may be a technical detail. Um, prior to these kinds of experiments, I thought that rainfall could be estimated from a simple thermodynamic scaling relationship to be about 7% higher for extreme rainfall for every degree of centigrade warming uh, locally. But it turns out that for hurricanes and other kinds of storms, this is an overly conservative estimate, and it's actually worse than what we initially thought just five years ago before Hurricane Harvey really initialized, initiated these kinds of studies, and probably about twice that, if not worse. 
The impact of this increased precipitation due to the human interference in the climate system can be profound. Here are some simulations that are, are showing flooding in this neighborhood of Houston where about 8,000 homes were flooded. The top panel shows a credible simulation of the actual flood as it happened, and the bottom one shows an estimate of the flooding if uh, the human influence was really large. We, we, we put uncertainty bounds on these, uh, on these statements. This is sort of the worst possible case. What you can see in that sim simulation is that there's a lot uh, fewer uh, homes, a smaller region that is flooded um, if climate change had been decreased by um, that particular estimate. And that the flood that did happen, regardless of whether there was climate change or not, was about a foot deeper. These, uh, these maps and this data is actually available online. You can contact me if you want it. Um, you're welcome to have it. Um, we use that, these maps, um, to do a number of studies, one of which is to estimate the attributable cost of Hurricane Harvey due to climate change. A conservative estimate of Hurricane Harvey is that the damages were about $90 billion. Some estimates are somewhat higher. Taking our best estimate for the human-induced increase in rain, which is 19%, we find that there's a 14% increase in the flood area if property values are uniformly distributed across the region, which of course they're not, but that's an assumption. Um, we make an estimate that climate change added $13 billion to the cost of, of Hurricane Harvey. Another paper that we have in review examines these maps in more detail, finding that the impacts of this increased flood area is not distributed uniformly across the populations, and that, uh, not surprisingly, um, the poorest among us are the ones most impacted. I'd like to leave you with a very sobering message, and that is that dangerous climate change is already here, and it's because of us. It's because of our burning of coal, natural gas, and oil. It is not our grandchildren's problem. It is our problem. The impacts are here. They're significant. The summer of 2021, I think, is a, uh, a pretty clear example of that. It will get worse. It will get worse because there's a certain amount of climate change baked into the system that we haven't realized yet. Um, but it also get worse because we continue to burn fossil fuels. We can only stabilize the climate if we reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases completely. And that's a tall order. And so how fast we can reduce the rate of warming is largely a political problem to, uh, to, to commit to a rather significant investment in changing our energy systems, the way that we get energy, so that we are no longer polluting the atmosphere like we do. Getting to zero emissions may take a very long time. And so I would like to stress that adaptation is urgently required to limit damages and human suffering. So thank you. This is a picture of a fire in California this year, um, rather terrifying. Um, but I would like to leave you with uh, um, the thought that, that this, this program is a step towards uh, addressing some of these issues. And um, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I'd like to go straight into the program tonight. So please welcome the Chief Marketing Officer from Electron. Here's Charlie Levine. Hello, my name is Charlie Levine and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Electrion. Today, there are national deadlines in many countries in place, banning the sale of gas and diesel vehicles. And this is driving fleet owners to develop electrification plans. And the world is now expected to move more than 1.4 billion vehicles to electric. Let's say we're able to replace half of these vehicles with electric in the coming decade. We must ask ourselves if we have the global resources that are actually required to make this shift. And today, the common approach favored by most automotive industry players is to manufacture large batteries to counter range anxiety. But these batteries need to be replaced every four to eight years, and we do not have sufficient recycling policies in place today. And fleet owners in particular have many additional challenges when they're shifting to electric. They have high upfront costs and need a lot of real estate for the charging stations themselves. 
they have to purchase electric vehicles, which are more expensive due to the batteries. And charging their fleet requires a big grid connection. And as they mostly charge in the evening and overnight, it puts a huge additional pressure on the grid, a grid that also needs to support millions of other vehicles, all charging at the same time. And operating an electric fleet is quite different from operating a diesel or gas fleet. And in order to keep the same level of service that we as the consumer have become accustomed to, means that the fleet owners will have to purchase additional vehicles to cover charging downtimes. So this is why existing plug-in charging solutions cannot empower the shift alone. They are not future-proof and they are not sustainable. Whereas wireless charging can accelerate EV adoption because it can be installed anywhere, it can be used anytime by anyone, and it makes charging more accessible, it reduces the total cost of ownership and offers maximum CO2 reductions, as we will see. So at Electrion, we believe in transforming dead or idle time into charging time. And that's why we offer three different modes of charging. Our dynamic charging solution, or what we call an electric road system, charges vehicles as they drive. And today, this is the perfect solution for fleets that drive on fixed routes, like buses and delivery fleets running from point A to point B and returning. Our semi-dynamic solution works for vehicles that move slowly like taxis waiting to pick up passengers outside airports or train stations, for example. And our stationary charging solution is a great um, solution for vehicles that are parked or are waiting like at the loading docks for last mile delivery fleets, at ports, at bus terminals, or even at classic parking lots. So how does our technology work? Well, the system is based on inductive energy transfer. And this means that we transmit energy over the air from one coil to another. We have three main components in our system. The management unit that is located at the side of the road. We have two models, above ground and below ground. It enables power to be transferred from the first coil, which is located underneath the road or the paved area to the secondary coil, which is located just under the vehicle in a receiver pad. The system is completely passive and safe until there's an authenticated vehicle directly above the coil. Our system is completely unique as it can charge up to 60 vehicles simultaneously. There are more benefits as well associated with wireless charging. The system offers a shared platform that supports all types of electric vehicles. All components can be underground, so there's no visual impact, no physical hazards, no real estate, and the system is completely automated, so people with um, physical disabilities have the same level of accessibility as everybody else. We can deploy up to one mile of our electric road in one night, or pave an a complete um, facility in one night. The integration on the vehicle side can be done in a matter of hours, and it requires zero change to the vehicle itself. We can also integrate with any type of vehicle, regardless of the automotive, automotive manufacturer or, or the, the battery type. Um, and we've applied a modular approach. So that means that we meet the higher energy requirements of larger vehicles by increasing the number of receivers under the vehicle. So let's take a look at how wireless charging can help decarbonize the transport sector. So while other companies are focused on optimizing batteries, we focus on minimizing them. In two of our public projects, we've installed stationary charging at urban bus terminals and a short stretch of our electric road system along the bus route itself. This enables the buses to receive regular top-up charging throughout the day and means a bus can drive for 24 hours without overnight charging at the depot or the need to stop throughout the day for dedicated charging time. This top-up strategy, as we call it, also means we can reduce the battery capacity by up to 90%, as we demonstrate in Karlsruhe in Germany and in Tel Aviv in Israel. In fact, in our Tel Aviv project, we're demonstrating that a, a bus can operate with just a 42 kilowatt capacity, supercapacitor. So a huge reduction there. And in Sweden, 
we show that a 40 ton electric truck can be equipped with a small and light battery and still have extended range when wireless charging is deployed al along major transit corridors. Wireless charging also spread spreads energy demand over time and space. It flattens peak energy demand and reduces the required grid connection. Studies show that electric road systems offer the highest possible CO2 emission reduction of all known technologies. In fact, 67% more than fuel cell vehicles. And wireless charging projects can easily be integrated with on-site renewables like this solar fence, fence, for example, along a wireless electric highway. Just one kilometer of this solar fence can provide up to one megawatt of power every single day. That's only on one side. And this decreases the pressure on the grid and reduces the requirements for energy storage devices as well. So you may be thinking that, of course, this convenience comes at a price premium, but that's not the, fact, the facts at all. Wireless charging technology is more cost-effective than plug-in charging options, simply because it reduces the required grid connection expenses, because it reduces the fleet battery costs, and because one single system is built to charge dozens of vehicles simultaneously. So today, uh, Electrion operates the world's largest um, uh, public wireless electric road. It's just over one mile long, and it's in Sweden. We're the first company to show a 40-ton electric truck charging from this road. And we've also integrated our technology with multiple different vehicles, including uh, private vehicles, and buses, and vans. We have strong global partners that support us and our technology in its scaling up phase. And we have five pilot projects underway at various stages today in four countries across Europe and the Middle East. And these pilots are just the first step towards decarbonizing sustainable electric transport because Germany, Sweden, France, and Italy have all included electric road systems in their national transport decarbonization strategies. So we have a long way to go, but we're definitely taking the first steps. So thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to get in touch and discuss anything with me, my email is here. Um, and to stay up to date with our growth and scale journey, you're welcome to follow us on LinkedIn. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. My name is Nathaniel Benjamin. I'm the VP Business Development at uh, Biomilk. Thank you to the Explorers Club for inviting me. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick intro into the cutting edge work we are doing at Biomilk, which will uh, hopefully make the world healthier and, uh, and better for the generations to come. Uh, our objective at Biomilk is to allow the production of dairy products that will have the highest nutritional value and the lowest carbon footprint. Just taking one minute to give you a quick background about, about us. So we are a fairly young company uh, started to operate a bit over a year ago. But actually, we started with the acquisition of a unique technology that's been developed since 2009 at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel uh, by Professor Nwit Agov. Uh, she's a world expert in to the field of uh, lactation physiology and for over a decade she's been researching the topic of uh, making basically milk through mammalian cells. Uh, so just a quick overview, we've been very fortunate to enjoy some uh, great financial backing. Actually we became the first cultured milk company to ever go public. Uh, lately we put uh, laid the ground for a strategic partnership with Coca-Cola Israel, which is one of the top dairy companies uh, in Israel and also in South, South Africa. Uh, and our two main uh, developments uh, are in the field of uh, cultured milk from animals and uh, also making human breast milk uh, in a lab. So I'm just starting with, with, with the, the basic question of what is milk? So milk is that uh, white liquid we all uh, love to, to drink and also the, the basis for all the dairy products, but it's an extremely complex uh, 
food and biomaterial, which is made mainly of water, but many macro and micro uh, nutrients as well. Um, unfortunately, as most of you are aware, the dairy industry has um, a pretty bad environmental impact. So extreme use of lands, uh, you need almost a thousand liters of water just to make that one liter uh, carton of milk that you buy at the supermarket. Uh, obviously, animal welfare is a pretty big topic. And uh, in general, the dairy industry is responsible for uh, a pretty high amount of uh, gas emissions, especially methane. So this is where uh, we come in. And basically, so I, I have a limited uh, amount of time, so I'm just going to give you a high-level explanation of how we, we make milk. Uh, so we, we start by isolating cells uh, from mammals. Uh, we then culture those cells uh, in a unique set of bioreactors. Uh, basically, we're feeding the cells to grow, multiply, and then feeding them with uh, an additional proprietary sort of cocktail to signal to the cells that it's time to start secreting milk. And uh, this is how we get uh, most of the milk components uh, through our process. And it, th that comes with, with unique benefits. Uh, first and foremost, uh, that product is safe, highly safe since it enjoys some lab grade uh, quality control. Obviously a positive environmental impact and What's most fascinating about the technological process developed at Biomilk is that we are able to control the yield of the cells. So we can basically gauge the, 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 the level and the concentration of all the nutrients and, and the extremely valuable nutrients that are present in milk. Uh, the dairy market is booming all over the globe. Uh, it's going to become a $1 trillion industry in uh, four years from now. But that growth, that constant growth is extremely challenging. So you know that we're, we're about to feed about 10 billion people in the globe in 2050, which is pretty close from now. Uh, all the countries are looking for ways to control their, their supply chains. And our value proposition is, is becoming extremely relevant for the years to come. And in the last one or two decades, there have been uh, constant growth in the alternative dairy space. The issue there is that, so if you're looking at all of them, so almond, rice, uh, soy, uh, all those alternative dairy products and, and milks uh, are not very nutritional for your body. Uh, they don't contain all those unique nutrients that are only present in milk. And they are also not functional for the industry. You cannot make those, those, those cheeses and, and creams and, and yogurts that we all love. Uh, so, bottom line, you know, we need more milk. Uh, the, the traditional farming has reached that, that glass ceiling and overall the industry is unsustainable. So, there is definitely a need for, for a paradigm shift in this industry. Um, so, with our process, we are able to make milk, as I said in the beginning, from all mammals. So, this is just an illustrative picture uh, and probably one of the most fascinating development uh, at Biomilk is the, the development of cultured human breast milk. Uh, the, the infant formula market is also a booming industry, uh, especially in the Far East. It's going to cross the $100 billion mark in four years from now. Um, the, the issue there is that the, the traditional infant formula is still pretty far away from, from, from the human breast milk which contains some, some unique components that are responsible for uh, a positive development of, of babies and infants. Uh, and this is that gap that we are, we are looking to close. Um, our strategy is, is, is definitely built on, on partnerships. Uh, the same idea of the, that partnership we, we are striking with Coca-Cola Israel. We want to partner across the whole food chain of, of the dairy industry. So equipment, all the processing companies, the, the, the cheesy records companies, and obviously the, the infant formula. Uh, our model, as I mentioned, is basically built on, on partnerships with uh, licensing out our technology, but also joint ventures that we're working on, and, uh, and also direct sales of uh, cultured milk components to 
to, to the food and beverage industry mainly. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, thank you for the, for the opportunity. And uh, now you're going to hear from uh, Sonia Kastner, the CEO of Pano. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here uh, with all of you at the Explorers Club today. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Sonia Kastner. I'm the CEO and founder of Pano, uh, which is a company in San Francisco that is working on wildfire mitigation technology. And uh, prior to founding Pano, uh, I spent my career uh, in Silicon Valley working in tech companies, both in green tech or clean tech, including solar batteries. Um, I also worked at Nest Thermostat um, on building energy efficiency, but I also worked in a number of internet of things companies, which include smart home or wearables. Uh, and uh, back in 2019, I started thinking about ways that I could take uh, my skills and, and network from Silicon Valley uh, companies and tackle the growing problem of climate disasters. Uh, I, as we all have, have been living in the past uh, few weeks and months and, and years, uh, we can see that climate disasters are getting worse, like hurricanes, floods, and, and where I live in San Francisco, wildfires. And uh, I, I set out on um, a journey to see if technology could be helpful in mitigating this growing trend of wildfires. And I'm going to just go to a couple slides here um, for background. So, you know, some startups, uh, you know, are founded because the the founder just has an epiphany. Oh my God, the, you know, the world needs this new widget. But in the, that wasn't the case for Pano. In the case of Pano, we started out by interviewing experts in the wildfire community. And what we found was that there was a chorus of calls for new technologies, such as drones and cameras and artificial intelligence and, uh, and, and planes and, um, and sensors. And uh, we were hearing this from government. Uh, for example, the Newsom administration had done a, a summit back in 2019, as well as um, elected other elected officials, the power utility industry and the nonprofit industry and academia. Across the board, there was um, a, just uniform consensus that the technologies that we take for granted in smart home gadgets or a nanny cam or self-driving cars could be a powerful tool for detecting and confirming wildfires and allowing um, for a faster response. And so, you know, we, we looked around, we didn't see that many people working on this problem. And we decided to put together, you know, a team um, that, that could tackle this problem. So let me start by ex explaining how wildfires um, uh, detection and confirmation work today. And the, and the, er the area that we're focused on at Pano is the early moments of a fire. So um, what happens uh, traditionally is that a fire is first detected by a bystander who sees the fire and calls 911. And th usually that happens pretty quickly. I mean, there's some small per there's some percentage of fires where, where bystanders miss them, but in populated areas, uh, usually a bystander will call 911 pretty quickly. Um, the problem is that this is a pretty noisy signal. Um, what we've heard from our interviews is that for every one fire that is called in by 911, there's 20 false alarms that are also called in. You know, maybe there's fog that looks like a fire or, um, or somebody uh, uh, sees industrial smoke. So, so there's, you know, you know 95% of these 911 calls are actually not fires. And the other problem too is that it's often difficult for a 911 caller to describe the fire um, accurately enough to mount a response. Uh, they might be driving down the highway and they say, hey, I see smoke um, on my right. Uh, but they can't describe whether it's on the first ridge or the second ridge. Um, and also uh, they, the, the bystander cannot necessarily assess the severity of that fire. So then the second step is a mandatory confirmation step. So a single fire engine is dis dispatched typically. Sometimes it might be a surveillance plane if it's in a national forest. Um, and a fire professional uh, needs to go get eyes on that fire, confirm where it is, confirm that it's actually a fire and, and assess the severity. And only then, um, does the full response start, which might be planes, helicopters, bulldozers, and other ground support. And the problem is, is that this whole process can take an hour or more, and that delays the time for the full response. And this was fine back in the 70s and 80s, but today's fires are growing or spreading faster. And so every minute matters. And now the the ideal um, initial response is to actually get that heavy resources onto the ground within minutes or within the first hour when the fire is still 
10 acres or less. Um, and so Pano set out to, to see if we could um, add new technology to support that goal. Um, so the system that we've developed is called Pano Rapid Detect. And it starts with detection. And with detection, the more sources of detection, the merrier. So first of all, we ingest the traditional 911 calls. Civilians still have a very important role to play in detecting fires. Um, but we also pull in satellite feeds from the NOAA um, fire detection um, satellite algorithm. And we also do our own uh, uh, artificial intelligence smoke detection on our camera feeds, which I'll show you in a minute. So we detect the fire through many methods, um, cameras, satellites, 911 calls, uh, and then the cameras um, are a really powerful tool for confirmation. And I should mention, these are cameras that we place on mountaintops and we rotate them 360 degrees at all times so that we always catch the early moments of smoke. And then finally, um, we have dissemination. So we have built powerful software tools that our customers who are um, typically fire authorities or, um, or utility um, emergency managers, um, uh, we give them powerful software tools to allow them to assess the location of the fire, the severity of fire, and also share that rich camera imagery with all the first responders involved in the response. And actually, a lot of different agencies are involved when it comes to uh, attacking these, um, these critical wildfires. So um, uh, the core of our technology are mountaintop cameras. Uh, and, and think of these as like a modern day lookout tower. You know, in the past, there were hundreds of lookout towers across the country um, where, um, where uh, 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 individuals would, would stay for weeks at a time looking for smoke. We do this with cameras. So we put cameras on, for example, a cell tower or a water tank. This is an example of a water tank. We can also put them at private homes. And um, that becomes our situational awareness tool uh, in addition to other feeds. And so I mentioned one of the sources of detection is artificial intelligence, smoke detection. And let me just show you a, a montage of some of our detections. These are actually from prescribed burns from earlier, uh, earlier this year. Let's see, it's loading a little slow on Zoom. Here we go. So here is an um, example of, of one detection. Here we're going to another one from the same station. And we're using the same type of artificial intelligence models that would be used in say your Nest Cam or in a self-driving in your Tesla for self-driving car, we train our model on images of smoke and non-smoke. And then as we gather more and more data, our AI model just gets better and better at detecting smoke. So that's what's happening in our back end is that we are we're detecting wisps of smoke um, in the back end using artificial intelligence. So finally, I'd love to show you our um, uh, our actual Pano 360 web interface that our customers use. And again, our primary customers are um, our fire authorities like city fire chiefs, county fire chiefs, state fire chiefs, as well as emergency managers at, at, um, at uh, enterprises like power utilities. So on the left, you can see a list of incidents. We're already at incident uh, 438 this year, sadly. Um, and then the other tab, we have all of our stations. And these are include, we actually have some stations in Portland as well as around the Bay Area. We also have some in Colorado. And in this view, you can see the full 360 view from each one of our stations all in one place. Because again, we're rotating the cameras and then we're stitching uh, every minute, we're stitching the full 360 into a panorama. So why don't we dive in on one of these stations? This is uh, up in Lake County. And again, you can see a full 360 here. And another way to to see if this is the full screen mode. This is actually what the 360 looks like on full screen. And you can see it's extremely high resolution. Um, and we actually allow you to digitally zoom in to any location and play a time-lapse in that zoomed in location. And if you were to see smoke here, we could actually mark the base of the smoke. Uh, and I'm not gonna mark that because there's not actually a fire today. And let me show you what one of these, a couple of these incidents look like. So. Here's an example of, um, this was a fire in Lake County um, it, over Labor Day weekend. So here's a view of smoke. And this was actually a case where we were able to see the smoke from two different stations on two different mountaintops. And the, the, so I mentioned we have AI that helped us detect the smoke, but we have another really important algorithm, which is our, our bearing algorithm. So what we do is we map this direction of the camera uh, 
and we map it onto, um, onto the actual map of the area. And we do that for both stations. And that allows us to triangulate and determine the lat long of that incident. And you can see here in the incident pane, here we have calculated the lat long. And this, our, our users can copy and paste this into say a helicopter's GPS so that the helicopter can get there and douse the fire while it's still small. Um, here's another example. Uh, this is where we were kind of a, you could say we were we were kind of a little bit of a, a fun police on this one. This is in um, near Redwood City, right near uh, Silicon Valley. Um, this is an example where our AI picked up this very small wisp of smoke um, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, which we thought was strange. And we looked on the bearing and we saw that it was exactly along the location of a park, Hutter Park. And this time of year in California, you're not supposed to be having barbecues because of the fire risk. So we sent off a notification um, uh, to our um, to our customer. I should mention, we also have a, a human in the loop. So we have a Pano Intelligence Center that's viewing each one of these AI alerts. And in this case, our Pano Intelligence Center said, you know, this doesn't look like a wildfire. This looks like probably a barbecue because it's not growing. So we, we set out an alert and said, we think there might be a barbecue in Hutter Park. And our customers were really excited about this one because um, typically in this area, it's very difficult to locate smoke. It, it turned out an, a minute after we notified the fire department, they did get a 911 call that said, hey, I see smoke in the mountains. But the 911 caller couldn't describe where the smoke was coming from. And normally their process, if it hadn't been for Pano, they would have needed to drive up to this ridge line and look out with binoculars and see if they could find where the smoke was coming from. But in the case of of uh, the panel alert, we told them, hey, illegal smoke likely coming from Hutter Park. They just drove over there and asked asked the folks to kindly wrap up their barbecue um, and, and potentially averted a, a bigger blaze. So our customers are really excited about this functionality. I'll show you just one more. This was, um, this was a, a, a wildfire, again, in Lake County. This is many miles away. You can see we triangulated the location of this one over 20 miles away. Um, here's the view from the other station. And, uh, and so you actually don't need too many of these stations, you know, on the order of, of hundreds or thousands of these across, uh, probably on the order of a few thousand of these across the entire Western United States to be able to cover all the high fire risk area of the United States. And um, our, uh, so this year is our first year we're piloting technology and we have 22 stations installed The all aspects of the technology are working. Our customers are delighted. And our goal um, going into next year is to just find more customers, city fire departments, state fire departments, county fire departments, um, as well as um, uh, uh, large private landowners like timber companies or or or, um, or power utilities, uh, water utilities. So um, if you know anyone out there who is uh, who is looking to mitigate their wildfire risk, um, we're really uh, excited to partner with them to continue to expand in the 2022 fire season. Thank you. Hi everyone. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to join you uh, today or whenever you're watching uh, this video. Um, my name is Karin Komstad Webb and I'm uh, Head of Environmental, Social and Governance for Heidelberg Cement in our Nordic region. Um, and it's a great pleasure to talk to you about how we look at climate change today and climate adaptation of our uh, operations. Um, I have uh, over 10 years of experience in the company uh, and in particular in the Nordics uh, and those 10 years uh, that have passed uh, so far have been a great pleasure because we have seen so much happening uh, and so much work uh, put into where we are today and also looking ahead it's with great excitement now when we're really tackling the big projects that's going to make a difference to uh, climate adaptation for real. So what I'm going to talk to you uh, about today is how we see um, um, how we're going to target uh, the world's first climate neutral cement plant. Um, and our ambition is that this plant is going to be uh, operating uh, in Sweden in uh, just under nine years. By 2030, we would like to press the bu button for this uh, plant. Now, first, a little framing of who we are and uh, in particular, how we, uh, we in Heidelberg Cement um, tackle climate change uh, and how we look at the necessary levers that needs to be put in place uh, for us to succeed, but also uh, for us to be able to contribute to the uh, climate uh, neutral built society. 
Heidelberg Cement is one of the, the global actors when it comes to cement production. Um, and uh, cement production has a challenge, but it also has an opportunity now when we're looking at how we as a society really need to cut emissions. Um, for us, we're working and focusing on uh, a few levers. We're working on, on the so-called conventional levers, how we uh, switch fuels uh, in our manufacturing. We work on a lot of circular economy related issues, how we can contribute to circulate other industries um, uh, waste uh, and other uh, materials in society. But as a consequence of the fact that limestone is and will be our primary resource for production, um, we also have a big need of finding solutions for carbon capture. That is, when we heat limestone as the predominant raw material, um, we release CO2 from that raw material. And that is the key for cement industry, to actually find solutions of getting hold of that CO2 uh, in so-called carbon capture technologies and ensuring that that CO2 does not reach the atmosphere. So that is why CCS and CCUS, uh, carbon capture, and utilization or storage solutions are of essence to the cement industry. Now, how far have we come? Well, uh, we started this journey uh, in the Nordics within Heidelberg Cement uh, more than a decade ago. Um, we are actually currently underway of constructing the first industrial scale uh, CCS facility uh, in our uh, Norwegian operations uh, at the cement plant in Breivik in Norway. Uh, and this is a result of a very good collaboration together with the Norwegian government for years. Um, now, what we want to do now is to scale up. We want to take this first ever industrial, um, uh, industrial experience from Norway and scale it up to be actually be able to reach full carbon neutrality at a cement plant. That is what we're aiming at. And by succeeding in doing so, uh, we will also succeed in um, the first worldwide carbon neutral cement plant, and that will be located in Sweden. Now a few more words uh, about the Norwegian project, because that connects very well to what we're now looking at to achieve uh, in, uh, in Sweden. Uh, what we're actually at the moment building uh, on site is uh, a full scale carbon capture plant. It will capture 400,000 tons of CO2 per year. Uh, and from the plant, we will transport the CO2 by ship uh, out to uh, the North Sea, where it will be geologically stored. Uh, now, this has been uh, a joint effort together with the Norwegian government that is also um, has been very supportive also when it comes to finding ways of uh, co-financing the whole project. Um, as I said, we are now constructing it, and by 2024, this project will be, uh, in com uh, be commissioned. Now, building on the experience and building on the fact that we now in Norway are setting up the world's first full value chain, full CCS value chain, with capture at the Breivik cement plant and storage by uh, the joint venture uh, Northern Lights in the North Sea, um, we build on the experience and we build on the infrastructure also established for uh, geological storage when we're now looking ahead and looking to scale up uh, at the Slita plant in Sweden. Uh, now the ambition is to transport the CO2 to the same infrastructure in the North Sea, um, but it's also very highly welcome that what we also see at the same time now in this region is the development of more storage sites for this type of solution. So this is just at the very beginning of the rollout of carbon capture technologies, uh, both for the cement industry, but also for other actors. Now to the Slitha plant and why it is just both for us, but also for, uh, for the Swedish construction industry, so important that we reach our ambition with actually be able to press the button in 2030 for this um, for this installation. Well, the Slitter cement plant, that is one of Europe's largest cement plants. Uh, what we produce there constitutes about three quarters of the total volume of cement used in the Swedish society. So this is actually key both 
for us, but also for our customers and the whole uh, construction industry to reach the combined climate targets and also the combined national Swedish climate targets. Uh, by succeeding with this, uh, this investment and this uh, carbon capture facility, we cut the national emissions with over 3% in Sweden. And the ambition is to capture up to 1.8 million tons of CO2 every year. Um, and uh, this will be a combination of fossil CO2 emissions, but also biogenic CO2 emissions. And there will be a, a greater and greater proportion of um, biogenic CO2 emissions since we're moving more and more away from fossil energy to bioenergy in our production. And how does the time, time schedule look like for us then? Well, we are currently uh, uh, in the middle of the pre feasibility study, uh, a pre feasibility study that's conducted during 2021. We will finalize that by Christmas this year. Uh, and that's a study where we're looking at how, um, what kind of capture technology will we look at, uh, will we choose, and um, how does uh, the energy balances and the energy requirements look like at site. Um, we are conducting environmental impact assessments. Uh, we're, of course, looking also at the finances. How much will this uh, installation cost and how much money will it cost to operate it? Um, so these are key questions in combination, of course, with uh, logistics questions and also how, how the CO2 is actually going to be transported to the site where we can geologically store the CO2. Now, the pre-feasibility study will take us into a feasibility study that we're looking, uh, looking at for the next year and then following that, uh, a further engineering phase uh, before we are ready for an investment decision. Uh, then a few years of commissioning, and then we are at 2030. Uh, now, uh, for this kind of um, uh, operation or developing of industry, we, we see also a, a very typical situation where we have to work combined with uh, and together with many other actors in society. One key issue for this um, project is that uh, it will de be dependent on uh, much more electrical power meaning that parallel with our developing progress, we also need to see um, investments in, in the power grid um, supplying the plant. Uh, and we also, of course, need to work with local authorities and politicians uh, hand in hand to make sure that we get the necessary permits and the conditions to actually follow through now uh, the coming nine years. So just a, a quick overview of what we're actually creating here. Uh, as mentioned, um, the CO2 emissions out from the, the cement plant today, it's a combination of uh, fossil fuels uh, and uh, fossil emissions and also biogenic emissions. Uh, by extending the carbon capture facility to actually cover uh, up to all the available CO2 that we have, uh, we will actually be able uh, because we have so much bioenergy in, uh, in the production, uh, not only to reach carbon neutrality uh, through this investment, but actually also to create a carbon sink. Uh, the plant and our products will actually be, cli be climate positive once we are um, uh, up and running with this solution. the absolute keys uh, to be able uh, to succeed uh, with this ambition. Uh, first and foremost, we see that we need to be able to work with uh, those actors that we are dependent on. We need an enforced power supply. We have also support the the market. Uh, we see it as necessary that we work together with the states and also with the help us uh, over these thresholds as forerunners. Because um, we do take on a little bit of risk when we do this, uh, and that has to be somehow mitigated here. Uh, I am convinced that we are quite quickly moving into a, a scene where the market 
will be there um, where customers will be able, will be wanting um, to uh, to pay for uh, fully climate neutral cement because what's what it's all about is effectively you and me when we buy buy our house um, and if we buy an apartment maybe we're talking about a cost of an additional 0.5 percent uh, for having a cement uh, produced fully climate neutral versus the more conventional way. Uh, so it's quite possible to actually achieve this market uh, demand, I would say. Um, what's also very welcome and what we see in, in the Nordics and in Europe is that uh, more, a, a more systemic approach to carbon capture and storage solution is under development. Uh, and also that we see that these types of solution is now moving to be applicable also to industrial emissions. This is very welcome. It needs to continue, uh, but I'm also convinced that we are on a good pathway towards a situation where this will be not only one and two cement plants, but that we actually see that um, many industries where this is an interesting solution to actually um, uh, reach uh, significant emission cuts, this will be a, a solution for the future. So. Um, with all these pieces in the puzzle in place, uh, I'm quite convinced that we in less than nine years now um, will be able to actually press the button for the first uh, climate neutral cement plant in the world in Sweden and within Heidelberg Cement. So with uh, those words, I would like to say a very, very big thank you to all, all that has been, have been listening. And uh, please uh, uh, let me know if you have any more questions. Uh, I'll be there to answer them for you. Thank you.